Listen up, trusted friends. Start up, trust smarter, execute your plan, take action. If you are ready to listen up, here is today's story. Josh Scanlon, Certified Financial Planner, Founder of Heritage Wealth Planning. I am Mitchell Chadro, your host, and this is The Listen Up Show. Today's entrepreneur, our guest, Josh Scanlon. Josh has a YouTube channel where he shows you how to make successful financial planning a reality for you. With a great sense of humor, the heart of a teacher, and the discipline of an Army drill instructor, Josh takes what to some may appear to be the complex world of investment management, social security tax, retirement planning, and wealth transfer strategies as he educates all of us on his popular YouTube channel. He is an objective fee only personal planner, has been helping people for over 20 years providing honest, straightforward guidance on how to better your current situation. He started his financial services career with Vanguard and the Jack Bogle philosophy and was named as one of America's top financial planners by the Consumers Research Council of America for 2008 and 2010. He has also served in the U.S. military. Welcome, Josh, to the Listen Up Show. How are you today, sir? Hey, thanks, Mitchell. Appreciate it. Doing just fine here in uh, North Georgia. Beautiful morning, sir. Well, that's great. You know, we are ready to listen up. So are you ready to tell your story? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Well, you know, Josh, that's what I love to hear. So how did you make the transition from an employee working for Vanguard to starting up your own business? Well, the Vanguard was a long, long, long time ago, back in the late 90s. So uh, I've been in a employee as a W-2 employee uh, for 20 years. And then uh, as uh, what I thought was comfortable at USAA for the last 10 years here in North Georgia, right north of Atlanta, and we had a nice little suburban office, you know, the commute was about 15 minutes or so. And, and then as corporate America does, uh, you know, they pull the rug out from under you, which uh, it doesn't make, you know, it, to this day, I still don't understand it. But at the end of the day, they call the shots and you fall along. So my opportunity was uh, to sit in a lane of traffic an hour and a half each way every day and uh, essentially kill myself daily. Um, there's only... So many times I can listen to Mitchell's podcast before eventually just, you know, you can only listen to so many podcasts before you want to go insane uh, sitting in the traffic. When you tell that story, it kind of reminds me of the movie Office Space, the line of traffic. (laughs) The guy walking. (laughs) (laughs) Did did you love that? Oh, man. That was (laughs) – I never – that guy bumps up his rap music, so it was just fun. That was was awesome. Then Office, the movie, the the show, same thing, but – um, and so I, I decided to uh, leave my what I thought was a uh, comfortable life at USA, and I, I somewhat enjoyed it. I mean, whenever you're working for the man, you gotta watch what you say, watch what you do, and and I'm pretty opinionated. So, but it, you know, I mean, you get paid nicely. It's the same old story, Mitchell. You've heard a million times a Sunday. And then I went working for a couple smaller firms, thinking this would give me a little bit more freedom. But, you know, at the end of the day, if it's not your firm, um, you have to respect what your boss says and your boss who owns the shop, you know, I mean, if you're you're trading your soul for the paycheck. And so eventually I said, you know, I, I just I got too much to say. And, uh, and I just started my own firm, uh, like I said, Heritage Wealth Planning, back in March of this year. And it, I tell you, Mitchell, it was liberating. Everyone says it. So he said, I wish I would have done it earlier. Everyone says that. And, and I 100% get that. But it, it's not just about – it's just liberating. There's no other way around it. You get to say whatever the heck you want to say. You know, come hell or high water, you will be held accountable, or you will you know, make the profits, whatever. And it's just it's it's the difference between night and day. There's no other way around it. I, I love being self-employed. It's awesome. So tell us about the steps you took yeah. in starting up your business. Well, in the uh, investment advisory world, and this is an area that I still challenge to this day, is that. I frankly don't manage money. I don't want to manage money. I think managing money is a waste of money for the client and it's a waste of time for the uh, the money manager. I, I just don't find value in that whatsoever. Uh, and obviously that goes back to uh, you know me cutting my teeth at Vanguard. But even before that, I read all the literature on 
on, uh, when I was in uh, school on a um, on stocks, investing, and things of that nature. But uh, there's no value to be created by paying someone to manage your money for sure. So, so, but at the end of the day, you still, for some ungodly reason, have to register as a registered investment advisor. And I, I, I don't know that to be true. It's just that's what everyone says because that's what everyone has to do. In my world, yet the steps are you have to get registered, and that means you got to go either before the SEC the Securities Exchange Commission, or for your state regulatory agency. And for me, it's just a state because, again, I don't manage money, so I'm not sure why I have to even be registered as a registered investment advisor. But apparently if you're doing financial advising in any capacity, you have to be registered as a RIA, a registered investment advisor, even if you're not actually managing money. It boggles the mind. And I, I, the, so there's it's all these little you know forms you got to fill out. You gotta wait before you come to register. It's just such a pain, man. And I, I just, it's not cheap. You gotta pay an attorney to draw up your LLC. You gotta pay an attorney to put your forms in before the, the securities administration of your state. It's just, it's a pain. And, uh, it, I, I actually think it's a barrier to entry to a lot of people who could be successful financial advisors. Uh, but the barrier is this mountain called regulatory environment that no one seems to know if you need to do it. It's crazy, Mitchell. But anyway, so that was the hurdles right there. But, you know, I put my head down. I hired somebody to do it for me, and, and she did an okay job. And, you know, so here we are, what, eight, nine months later? <laughs> well, you know, it, it, it's interesting because we, we talk to a lot of entrepreneurs, a lot of startups in terms of issues that they face when starting up their business. What other types of issues have you been faced with in starting up your business? Uh, the main thing is just your financial situation. I mean, that's what I talk about my YouTube channel a lot, but – I mean, you have to have you have to have some kind of money in order to pay the bills, and be it money through clients that you've uh, accumulated in the past, or through clients you're going to gather in the future, or what I'm doing is I said at the end of the day, Mitch, I just said, well, I had a nice little nut saved up in my 401k. I'm 48 years old, and uh, I can invest it with some other firms, or I can invest it myself. And so for me. I said, you know, I'll take the stupid 10% penalty for taking out distribution early. I'm not making much money in the first couple of years, so I'll pay 10% on the distributions I take out to pay the bills, but there's really no taxes because I'm not, you know, I'm not making money. Um, but I said I can invest in myself or invest in other guys' ideas or ladies' ideas. And for me, I said I'm going to invest it in myself, and I can keep doing it until I run out of money. And at the end of the day, it might be two years from now. Um, you know, it's uh, it might be – it might never have. I don't know, but – that was the number one thing is where does the money come from to pay the bills while you're trying to build up a business? And I got four kids, man. So my wife stays home. Um, you know, it's not like we're living cheap. That's for sure. I mean, I got a mortgage, uh, the whole thing. We had healthcare is a big one, uh, 2000 bucks a month to go on Cobra. And, uh, we just went off it just literally this month, September of 2018. So, um, you know, healthcare. The, the biggest concern, frankly, is the healthcare, and then obviously the, uh, the the financial situation. And you know, if you can live light, the financial situation won't be that big of a deal. Um, but if you, but you know, like I said, a family of six with one income, and I, we were making pretty good money before I started my firm. Thing for me, has been just phenomenal, and YouTube has been in, just enormous for me over the last five to six years in learning that. So anyway. Long story short, I started doing this, you know, a few years ago. I started doing uh, some – I've always done seminars, Mitchell, so I've always been active and just engaging the public with, you know, face-to-face -face interactions through seminars, obviously one-on-one -on -one client meetings. But, uh, you know, I, I just think for some reason I've been given ability uh, to to explain the complex in a way that normal people can understand. And I know you're an attorney, and this isn't badging attorneys, but estate planning attorneys are notorious, notorious – uh, for making this more simple, more complex, so that no one can understand what the hell they're talking about, and thus no one does their estate planning. And uh, and I just it boggles the mind. I don't know what they train in estate planning law school, but it's not in terms of the ability to communicate <laughs> with regular people. And, and the same thing with financial planning. I mean, all these financial planner guys, and like I say guys, all gender neutral folks, but you know, guys, they they talk a big game. But if someone walks out of your office, more confused than when they came in, then you've lost. I mean, that's not good. So, uh, so I just started looking at YouTube and I noticed a long time ago, there's this, uh, uh um, Durst, I guess, I don't know, there wasn't much in terms of financial planning. I just, it was all insurance salesmen. 
I said, well, I don't get this. Why is there no – if I want to look up durable power of attorney on YouTube, the only thing I can find is some lawyer from eight years ago. So do pretty good. Don't, don't get me wrong. But there's just a lack of financial education on YouTube unless it's insurance salesmen or day-to-day stock traders. And is it, it, I said there's an opportunity there. And I, there is. And I'm living proof of that. And so that was one of the things I said I wanted to go on my own so I could just go on YouTube and just, you know, start telling people like it is. And, you know, they can listen or not. Frankly, it's up to them. But that's basically the genesis of how I wanted to get clients, as I said, at the end of the day. I can do seminars in my local community in front of 15 people a pop, or I can do YouTube videos in front of, you know, thousands upon thousands of people potentially. And, uh, and that's what I chose to do. And, and it's funny, when you start doing it, at first it's weird, man. You're like, oh, this is kind of nerve-wracking. I'm not, you know. But then it's just, it's just, it's addictive. You, I, love, I love doing YouTube videos. I do it every day. I think about it all the time. I think, you know, like this morning I woke up at 4.30, like I always do, thinking what's my next video. And uh, it's just, anyway, that's the way for me to reach out to clients. And it's amazing how many people who have reached out to me who have never met me, who just literally a couple of weeks ago did not know who I am, but just happened across my YouTube channel. It's awesome. Listen up, trusted friends, because there's a lot of value bombs in what Josh just said. You know, our audience, our entrepreneurs, they're looking for business ideas. They're looking yes. on ways to sort of step by step. How how can I execute on this? And here you're using YouTube to basically come across to your audience in in a straightforward manner and and doing it in, in the way that you enjoy. And and I think that that's yes. really an inspiration and motivation for so many out there in the Listen Up audience. You know, I wanted to sort of jump right in to what, of course, you love most, and that's or one of the things that you love the most, and, and that is financial planning. You probably can tell us the top three big mistakes that you're seeing people make and what they can actually do today to start executing so that they can sort of go down a different path. The number one mistake is not understanding the tax code. I, I, I just, I, for the love of me, I don't understand. And it's because the financial industry is so, I just, I love the financial industry, Mitchell, but it is so just, I, I don't know, it's, it's, it, uh, financial planning is not investment management for the love of Mary. All these people say I'm a financial planner. Well, how did your investments perform? I'm like, I, what does that have to do with anything? Investment management is investment management. Financial planning is so much more beyond investment management. It's our industry's own part problem. And I, I don't get why we – all right, so number one mistake is not understanding the tax code. And that's all that is so, so important. And what I mean by that is if you're married filing jointly – you aren't going to be married finally jointly forever. You will be, you or your surviving spouse will be a single taxpayer. And the tax bomb that awaits that surviving spouse is immense, especially if they're tax deferred accounts, IRAs, 401ks, and all that. And I, you know, I even wrote a book on that called The Tax Bomb in Your Retirement Accounts. And it just talks about what I call the widow's tax trap, uh, the Medicare premiums from having huge required minimum distributions, your Medicare premiums can skyrocket, the taxes on your social security, just the tax, 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 tax. And everyone's like, oh, I want to talk about investments. Uh, did I beat the market? I'm like, that is so, so inf- just infantile relative to the tax bomb that awaits you, and yet people don't understand. And so give me, give me an example. Married, final, and jointly couple, and as of the Trump tax bill, if they're over 65 years old, has a 26,600 standard deduction. All right, so what that means, is people say, oh, I don't, you know, I'm going to take a mortgage because I need the, the tax write-off. And you're like, are you even itemizing? Do you even know? And if you're not itemizing, you're not getting a tax write-off. And just the lack of understanding. And I'll give you an example, Mitchell. This, I, oh. So I came across this client a year and a half ago, or a year ago, I guess, up in New Hampshire. And they had negative income, right? And the reason they had negative income, because they had rental properties and whatnot, negative income, but they had $300,000 in their IRA. And I'm sitting there thinking, and they're working with a supposed financial planner. And I'm sitting there thinking, you, this is this is wrong in so many ways here, because what's going to happen is at some point when they hit their Social Security, when they hit their uh, uh, RMDs, and when the rental income starts improving, because they had a couple of years they had rental income for various upkeeps and whatnot, I said, they should have been pulling money out of this IRA like white on right. That that sucker should have been reduced substantially 
uh, when they had negative income because, again, going back to standard deduction, just uh, – and, uh, and I said, I'd like to see your tax form. I mean, yeah, so we got to talk about after I saw the tax form. I said, did your previous financial advisor never ask? And they said, no. And I looked up the advisor, and he was a CFP. He had all the uh, credentials, but it just it was, it was just investment management. And that, ah, oh man, so that's number one right there. Not, and number two, what else do you see? Not having a durable power of attorney. Now, I'm not an attorney. I'm not practicing law. So any attorneys out there say, you shouldn't be practicing law. I'm not doing it. But a durable <laughs> power of attorney is a power of attorney that survives in capacity. And what that simply means is if you have an IRA or 401K, a big qualified account, those are individually owned. That means you own it. Your spouse does not own it, and your spouse has no rights to it until you die, and, and, assuming he or she's made the beneficiary. And so if you are held up in the hospital because of a stroke or something like that, and your spouse needs to have access to your IRA, 401K, your individually owned account, the only way she can do this, we'll say it's she in this case, is through either court order or durable power of attorney. There's no other way. And a court order doesn't happen you know, in two seconds flat. A court order is going to take some time for her to be named the agent to be able to act on your behalf. And you had a durable power of attorney. It can do that just right out of the gate. It just says, I have this durable power of attorney, Vanguard, who's the custodian of my money. And Vanguard is a tortoise for giving people a hard time as it is. But I have this record on file with you in advance of my husband having a stroke, which says I can act on his behalf if he's incapacitated. Now, the, there's a part two of this which drives me insane, too, and, and I don't know why attorneys do this. I mean, I kind of get it, but for most people, it says you need two doctors <laughs> to sign off on that your spouse is incapacitated. And I'm like, yeah, don't do that. And, again, I'm not practicing law. I'm just saying at the end of the day, my wife and I have a good relationship. I trust her implicitly. My money's her money. Her money's my money. But she can't have access to my 401K unless we have a durable power of attorney, and I don't want two doctors to have to sign off on it that says, Charlotte, you're going to be shielded from Josh's assets unless we get these not one but two doctors to say Josh is incapacitated. Screw that. We want her to be able to have access to my money today because my money is her money, her money is mine. And so that's number two, not having a durable power of attorney, and the corollary to that is if you have one, having two doctors have to attest that the person's incapacitated. That's just, I, it boggles the mind why that's written. I, I get it. There could be a second marriage. There could be some issues with a survive, the spouse maybe being a uh, shyster. I get all that. But if it's a normal, regular relationship, don't do that. And three. Well, three is just focusing on best of management so much. On a, I, there is absolutely no reason to pay a guy to run your money. There's no reason. I, anyone, they can say, oh, I can beat the market. I don't, you might be able to beat the market yesterday. You're not going to beat it on any consistency. The numbers are so – the evidence is so overwhelming against active managers with their fee. Because what happens, uh, Mitchell, is all these guys will say, we ran a Monte Carlo scenario that said you can take out 4.5% a year. All right, well, when you factor in fees at 1%, that 4.5% a year just went down to 3.5%. Isn't it ironic that no investment managers ever talk about that? And on top of that, you got to pay taxes as well. And so – what happens is the number one thing someone can do to reduce, to increase their performance of their portfolio is to reduce expenses, and, and the second is reduce taxes. How do you reduce expenses? You fire your money manager. And I, I tell you, I'll never get a job in the industry again because I, I just there's absolutely no reason to pay somebody one to one half percent to run your money. And again, if their argument is they can beat the market, all right, well maybe you can beat it over, you know. A couple of years, but there's no consistency there whatsoever. And frankly, that's so small potatoes anyway. I mean, you beat the market when the market is down 35% in 2008. You're only down 32%. Well, you beat the market, but you're still lost a third of your money. Does that make you happy? No. And so just the, that's number three. Absolutely. Number one way to increase your investment performance is fire money manager and just go straight to the Bogle model of indexing and be done with it. And just that's it. And, again, I know it ticks a lot of people off. Frankly, I don't care. I've been in business long enough to realize it's just it, it's it's all – you're making the, the investment managers rich off to the backs of the middle class. That's the way I look at it. And I just – I find it to be uh, – I just don't like it. There's no other way around. I, I, I probably should shut up there, but I, I don't like it. That's one of the benefits of being your own boss, Josh. Yes. So thank you. Thank you for being up front with, with the way that you feel. Our startup round is sponsored by TrustSmarter.com. 
still struggling to negotiate a better trust and estates deal with your trust company or trust bank, Trust Smarter is an online marketplace allowing consumers to access great trust and estates deals from multiple corporate fiduciaries, trust companies, without having to shop around on comparison websites or travel around to several or numerous trust banks completely free to consumers. Trust Smarter connects you directly to financial planners that Trust Smarter vets who are fee only and totally independent that will help you make informed decisions, saving you time, hassle, and money. Visit TrustSmarter.com. Okay, now back to the show. Here on the Listen Up show, Josh, we like to talk about not only free free resources, but freemium resources that we can recommend to our audience and as it relates here to financial planning. Can you talk to us a little bit about some of the tools that are out there for our audience members and those interested in sort of empowering themselves to start to look at and use on their own before heading on over to a financial planner? Absolutely. The, the first one is uh, MaximizeMySocialSecurity.com, and that's a, a, a professor at a Boston university named Larry Kotlikoff. Uh, Larry is literally the, the premier uh, expert in Social Security. Uh, he's an economics professor. Actually, uh, ran for president a couple times under the, uh, the, the platform that we're, we're just, we don't have the money to pay for the big three unfunded, which is Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. The money is just not there. Um, that doesn't mean it's going broke tomorrow. It just means <laughs> these are unfunded liabilities and uh, no one wants to tackle them. And, uh, and so Larry has run uh, for president twice, you know, somewhat of a rabble rouser in, in the industry. The investment industry doesn't like Larry. Um, neither do they like Jack Bogle when he started off. But Maximize My Social Security is awesome. And the reason for that is for 40 bucks a year. That's for the average consumer. You pay 40 bucks. You have at your, I'm just telling you, uh, Mitchell, you have at your fingertips the most wonderful financial planning software you could possibly imagine. And there's no sales pitch. It's completely nonprofit. I actually interviewed Larry myself and uh he kind of went over the uh how, how his firm <laughs> gets paid and it's uh it's, it's great so maximize my com cannot recommend that enough uh to just get started for your own personal financial planning now with that said i do believe you should hire and this is going to be biased from what i just said against the investment industry but you should should hire a real life financial planner and uh because just because you get the software doesn't mean you know everything that goes on. In fact, I assure you the vast majority of people have no idea what a durable power of attorney is, and they have no idea the difference between a living trust and a irrevocable trust. And, and, so, and the, why should they? I mean, they're too busy being rocket science to know what a living trust is, for instance. And if they need a living trust because they have real estate and various domiciles, and so there's all kinds of things that a real-life financial planner who does real-life financial planning can tell you that a software program can't. So I'm a big fan of hiring somebody uh, for that. And, uh, frankly, I'm a huge fan. I recommend this all the time, Mitchell, is that hiring a real-life estate planning attorney, too. Don't do LegalZoom.com. hope they're not an advertiser. Uh, but do a real-life estate planning attorney because, they, again, they know the stuff that's going on as we speak that the uh, legal zooms of the world don't, and, and specifically for you, as opposed to just what some software program says. So, the first place would be maximized by Social Security. I mean, forty bucks, man. Worst case scenario is you waste the money, and that's not much that you're out. So, that's a place to start for sure. You talk a lot about retirement planning, Social Security. I just saw recently Trump's executive order on required minimum distributions. Can you can you talk to us a little bit about about that and the latest in the financial planning world? Well, it's, a, it's an executive order. Um, it's funny because I came across that in the political feed I follow as opposed to a financial feed, which I kind of chuckled at. And, Frank, I didn't even know that Obama, one of his desires was to get, if you had uh, 250000 or less in a qualified plan, again, an IRA and all the other iterations of that, then he didn't want to require you to take required distributions. And I, I thought that was wonderful. So Trump, you know, the whole the point is at some point, we need to increase the the, the tables uh, for RMD requirements. So, folks, an RMD is required minimum distribution. When you hit 70 and a half, you are forced by law to start pulling some money out of your account uh, based on these 
tables, the IRS tables for required minimum distribution. And so the first year you take at the 31 December of the previous year, you have $100,000 in your account. You divide that by 27.4, and essentially you're going to have to take 3700 bucks out of your IRA uh, for that tax year and pay tax on it. Um, and that, that's not much. I mean, 3.5%, 3.7% to be precise, no big deal. But it gradually gets bigger and bigger and bigger until you're about 85 years old. You're taking, you know, 11, 12, 13% of your account value out. And generally by then, you're a surviving spouse. Your spouse has died. And so now you have larger RMDs with less tax reductions in terms of standard deductions and if we ever go back to exemptions and whatnot, and that's, i.e., the widow's tax draft. So Trump's EO, executive order, is saying we need to redo these tables and maybe as opposed to making seven and a half the day when the uh, the numbers kick in, we've got to start taking money out and maybe push them back to 75 as people are living longer. And, I, and I'm stoked. I think it's wonderful. I thought I thought if he uses the Obama thing, uh, Mitchell, where you say 250 or below, there are no RMDs. And then on top of that, you take a, a higher table for RMDs and a, a you know later year for when you have to start withdrawing that. I, I, man, it could be a, a bipartisan, and it could be a, a wonderful uh, way to to at least defer the tax man. Now, if I may, just real quick, remember, deferring taxes is not limiting taxes. It's just deferring them. So in any kind of qualified deferred account, an IRA and, again, all the other iterations, someone's going to pay the tax on that at some point. There's no getting around that. Someone's going to pay the tax. So just deferring in of itself isn't a panacea because you might just be kicking that can down the road to somebody else who's going to pay a much higher tax rate than you will. But it's still a step in the right direction, absolutely. Our fast pitch round is sponsored by Chadro.net, D-H-A-D-R-O-W.net. You and your family need legal protection. Wouldn't it be nice if there is an easier, less expensive option than a traditional lawyer. At Chadro.net, you get personalized services for your family and your business. That's 100% guaranteed. So go to Chadro.net today for personalized, affordable legal protection. Chadro.net has created a better place to turn for your legal matters. For example, startups, those who want to become an entrepreneur, need to incorporate a business and must protect your family with a will or living trust. Chadro.net makes it easy with step-by-step help when completing your personalized document, or you can even access an attorney to guide you. Chadro.net helps you get personalized and affordable legal protection in most states, and legal attorneys are available with every personalized document. To answer questions, get started at Chadro.net today, and now you're protected. Now, let's get back to it. You know, Josh, earlier you had mentioned the book that you had written, and I know that you've also written another book as well. I love books, and I actually have a book club, and I'm going to obviously have links to both your books right there at MitchellChadro.com slash books. Can you talk to us a little bit about those? Yeah, so two different ones, Mitch, and this is the impetus to go independent, actually, is because uh, there's, you know, limitations of what you could write about when you're working for the man, so to speak. And, and I just – so my first book was more towards, you know, 30-year-old, 30, mid-30s, early 40s family, um, following the traditional American dream of heavy debt, uh, you know, going to great schools, uh, just and it's all based on personal experience. So everything for me changed in 2007, as it did for many other people, in terms of my my understanding of how the traditional financial planning models are just insanely broken um, when it comes to debt, finding the best schools. You know, should you, just all that stuff is is just is a nightmare. Um, thankfully, I didn't have to go bankrupt, but man, it was it was there was some trying times back then, and. Uh, and uh, anyway, so I just wrote it as if I wish I would have known this in the past. Um, and, and that was – so that's more, again, towards mid-30s with families and whatnot, maybe – and, again, mid-40s, even 20s. Um, my second book is more of a uh, – was a was more passion. I mean, the first book I was passionate about. My second book was much more passionate about because it's written towards those who keep deferring their IRAs down the road, thinking that IRAs are wonderful, 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 when they're absolutely not. And um, that doesn't mean don't do it, but 
uh, is, is just geared to how the Roth IRA, Mitchell, and initially I call it 21 reasons you should have a Roth. Um, and I go through them 21 times. <laughs> 21 reasons are 21. Uh, that's great. That's the reason why you called it 21 reasons. Right, exactly. Can you can you tell us can you tell us the names of both those books so I can yeah. make sure to have a link to those? Yep. So the first one is called Strategic Money Planning: Eight Easy Ways to Get Your House in Order. Strategic Money Planning: Eight Easy Ways to Get Your House in Order. Uh, and then my second one is called The Tax Bomb in Your Retirement Accounts. The Tax Bomb in Your Retirement Accounts: How the Roth IRA Helps You Avoid It. And they're both uh, free on Kindle Unlimited. Both are four forty nine for regular Kindle, and I think uh, the second one is four no, five ninety nine for the soft, you know, paperback. That's the first one because it's all in color, which I wish I would not have done. Yeah, I think it's eighteen ninety nine, and I still think it's worth it. But they're, they're, in terms of the color, it's not worth. <laughs> I wish I would have done black. <laughs> this saves a lot of money for printing, but it's all good. Um, and so the, the second one I like is I just published that, and I got another one coming out uh, here shortly. This will be just an e- ebook, a e- Kindle book. On the can, can you uh, tease us with the can you tease us with the title? Yeah, uh, the retiree guide to state by state taxation. So we're going to go over each and every state's taxes for retirees from property tax, sales tax, and income tax, uh, with the various exemptions, you know, homestead exemptions, standard deductions, all that state by state. And I did YouTube videos on all this on every single state. And then I'm going to follow that up with uh, with the state by state guide to inheritance. And a state tax for your, like, we're talking about New Jersey, Pennsylvania's got an, an inheritance tax, Kentucky has an inheritance tax, New Massachusetts has an estate tax, so a lot of states don't have any, but the states that do would surprise you, so that'll be another one coming here pretty soon too, the state by state guide to inheritance and a state tax, your state estate tax. So no, that, that's wonderful. It's, it's really, it's really good stuff. Like I said, I, I found you because of the YouTube channel, and it's it's really terrific, Josh. What's the best business advice you've ever received? Um, there's a guy named Aaron Helmsley, and uh, I, he he's out of the business now. But his daughter, uh, Darcy Helmsley Brown, I think's her name. Anyway, Aaron Helmsley, he had done this thing, Mitchell, um, back in like probably '83 about sales, maximum sales strategy or something like that. I can't remember what it's called, and I got it. I just I just have to come across it. And it was all about the psyche, all right? It's all about, you know, being able to make a game out of being told no. And, and it's not just about sales, but it's just about your life. You can only control the inputs. You cannot control the outputs. So everyone in, in sales focuses on the output. I got to get the sale. I got to get the sale. And when and that you can't control the output. You cannot control if Mitchell says yes to buying your product. But I can control if I present Mitchell with an offer in which to buy my product. And so what Aaron teaches is that it's, it's oh man, it, I mean it's like revolutionary. At least it was to me, is that I can make a game out of it to tell Mitchell and Mitchell's you know all your neighbors and all that to say, this is my product, this is why you should have it, and just be done with it. And if Mitchell says yes or no, it's completely out of my it, – it doesn't matter. And so because of that, you just kind of train your mind not to feel like you're being told no by Mitchell, like he's not telling you personally that he's rejecting you personally, because you don't care. only thing you care about is, did I do what I can do, which is the inputs, and the outputs will take care of themselves. And it just it's – I cannot stress enough how – just mind-boggling of a change that was for me to say, I just control me. And it, it kind of, Mitchell goes back to, I hear all the time, well, that guy, you know, makes you mad. No, that guy doesn't make you mad. You're allowing yourself to be mad. You control if you're angry. You control if you're sad. And all these things are human emotions, but other people don't do it. You do it to yourself. And and I just, when you start thinking like that, it just it changes everything. Like, you're you're not reacting. I mean, you're just reacting to what other people are doing you can control your reaction. So control it, and you'll find very quickly that, huh, I'm not going to let that guy piss me off anymore. I'm going <laughs> to, doesn't matter. I'm going to be myself, and so be it. And, oh, talk about liberating. It, it, so anyway, Aaron Helmsley, um, I, I don't even know the website, uh, Maximum Sales Performance, I think is what it was. And uh, Yeah, no, I'll definitely have a link. 
I'll definitely have a link to that. What What is your definition of success? Um, uh, yeah, uh, my definition of success is just being able to do what the hell I want, uh, how I want to do it. You know what I'm saying? As, as I just once you get the the taste of liberation of being self-employed, it, it's like nothing I've ever experienced, Mitchell. It's just the best thing that's ever happened to me, other than you know my finding my faith to the big guy upstairs, and obviously marrying my wife, and my kids, but. It's it's like it never stops. You want to work. You love working. And it's not even work. I mean, literally, they say if you're having fun, it's not working. And I always thought that's kind of cliche, but it is, it is true. It, it is so true. You feel you have something to say to the world, and you want the world to hear it. Now, whether the world does anything with it, again, your input, I can't control that, but I can inputting what I share with the world. And uh, and that's my definition of success. I, you know, I've never been a guy that needs fancy. I don't. I just frankly don't care about my car. I don't. I just. I just don't care. But I do care about uh, having the ability to platform to say what's on my mind. And again, if people don't listen, that's fine. But man, I tell you, it is so. It's just what you're doing, Mitchell, to help folks. You know, maybe get off the mat with a thing. I'm beaten down. Um, and my boss is, I just, I'm telling you, man, if you can get anyone to just see the light of being self-employed, they will recognize they should have done it earlier. Uh, there's just no other way around it. It is, it is so liberating. It's awesome. Well, I'll tell you what, I, I, I really appreciate you telling our audience that, and I think that it will resonate with a lot of people. And your example, I feel, is something that people can continue to come back to because yeah. not only are you personally helping people, but you're, you're also living what it is that you're teaching. And I, and I think that that's a very powerful message to get across to the audience. Our wrap-up round is sponsored by BankSmarter.com. From digital banking, mobile banking, technological changes in the banking industry are affecting our personal financial lives forever. How does the average person and family learn how to bank smarter? Well, that's simple, banksmarter.com. You don't have to be part of the Silicon Valley, New York, or London Wealthy Club. With Bank Smarter, learn how you and your family can benefit from this global revolution. Traditional banking is being challenged to the core, and the next 10 years will only see more changes in money and finance than we have in the last 100 years. Today, banking is something you do, not traditionally somewhere you go. Bank Smarter teaches you and your family whether saving money, moving money around, or requesting credit. Consumer behavior is quickly changing because of massive shifts in many technologies which are changing the nature of how we think about money forever. Go to banksmarter.com. Josh, as we wrap up here, beyond your family, can you tell Tell us about the five people you surround yourself with or care the most about that have helped you in shaping who you are today. My granddad was number one. It was just something because I always thought that was what a, a dad and a, and a husband and a man should be. I mean, he lived in California. I lived in Maine. I was born and raised on an island in Maine, so I didn't have a whole lot of face to face with him. But I always looked up to him as what a a man should strive to, and uh, that might sound, but uh, I don't even know what it is anymore. I can't keep track of all the various isms, but uh, that's why I've always looked at my granddad as someone I should strive for. I think there's a guy named Nick Murray who writes, and I've never, I've met him one time. He would never know me, but it's just positive. You got to surround yourself with positive people, and and I find for for a a, a man uh, who, in particularly, in raised typical men are raised a lot of them now are raised from women, without a, a man's presence, a fatherly presence. Uh, it's easy to fall into, uh, you know, anger. You know what I'm saying, Mitchell, where you fall into, say, um, life's not fair, I'm pissed off all the time, blah, 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 and, uh, and that's not good. I mean, that, that will bring you down. And so find, you know, so this guy, Nick Murray, writes stuff, um, and he's been a huge impact, huge impact on me in terms of just getting through the fluff or the negativity that's always out there. And seeing the world for what it is, I mean, it's just, I, I tell you, man, the world is such a good place, so much better than it was 10 years ago, never mind 100 years ago. And it's so easy to fall into the trap that we're all doom and gloom. Um, and I, I, yeah, I don't really have that many, I've never really had, it's almost like Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan had a lot of acquaintances, but not a lot of close friends. And I'm kind of like that, too. I'm pretty reserved in my uh, in my day-to-day. I like to read and so a lot of the people who have had the most impact are uh, at Nassim Taleb, Nicholas, Nassim Nicholas Taleb. I read a lot from him because he's counterculture. I've always loved the, the cynic 
the cynical view of the uh, of what's kind of going out there in terms of the uh, the, the vast majority of opinion states one thing. I've always said there's got to be a, a counter to this. So I've always liked the cynical, uh, the contrarians. Um, but in terms of my relationships, yeah, frankly, I just I pray every day. I mean, my relationship with Jesus is is bar none for anybody because. <laughs> You know, at the end of the day, if Jesus lived, which I think he did, and if he died, which I think he did, and he rose from the dead, which I think he did, I think it's all proof I need right there. So my relationship with Jesus is number one over everything. But you got to surround yourself with positive people. And even as a Christian, it's easy to fall in the trap of negativity. Of uh, it's oh, I'll never be, and it just can't be like that, man. You got to be positive, and it's it's hard. So. Surround yourself with positive people, and uh, whoever those are, that's uh, that's that's what you got to do. And just two more people that you surround yourself with that have helped shape you who you are. Just my kids. I mean, I, again, I, at the risk of sound cliche, but when you're a dad, and I, you know, look, people do what they want to do, but kids keep you young. I'm 48 years old, but I'm goofy as could be because it's fun, man. I mean, you know, trust me, my kids drive me crazy. I drive them crazy. But you just can be goofy, and it, being goofy allows you to stay young at heart. So I have four kids, like I said, two girls, two boys. My oldest are girls, teenagers, which will, you know, make you insane. Uh, but it's just you get to be goofy around your children. Um, <laughs> it's fun. And you no, know, I hear you. And, no one cares. And so that's that, that four. So I'd answer that. You ask me for two, I'll give you four. All my children just keep me young. And uh, young and sprite, that's for sure. And, and I, I don't know, I don't think I would be if I didn't have kids. So let's put that way. Can you leave the audience with three main takeaways that they can start to basically execute on right away? Because we want them to take actionable measures. Yeah, the first one, is, I'm telling you, the lack of using YouTube bogs my mind. So my brother does an, uh, an ad agency, you know, an uh, online ad agency, and and I was helping him out with some stuff, and uh, and he's good at it. I mean, he's, he knows what he knows the stuff, and you know. So you're looking at I don't know dentist in Alfred of Georgia, all right. And Google is the number one search engine. Everybody knows that, but number two is YouTube, all right. And uh, ironically, uh, Google owns YouTube. So, so the issue is if you type dentist in Georgia, for instance, or uh, teeth whitening in, in Alfred of Georgia, let's just put it that way. Um, you're going to get a ton of stuff on the blogs, on Google, but if you go to YouTube, you're not going to get that much stuff. And I just – it's insane the opportunity that has been ceded to anyone who can get out there. And so i just give an example. There's a guy in North – I was looking for ways to just do some backyard work to get my water to drain away from my house and just using various PVC pipes and all that. And there's a guy in North Carolina that is doing it, and he put all this stuff out there free of charge for all to see. And if I was in North Carolina, even though he's doing it for free, I would call him and say, I want to pay you because I, I could probably do this for myself, but I trust what you're doing because you're doing it. I just, it's insane how many people don't use YouTube. It's, uh, it, it boggles my mind, actually, and that's fine, but you're seeding the ground to your competitors who are, and there's just not that many. So, so use, use YouTube more. Oh, stop with the blog. Put the video out there. All right. So that's number, that's number one. What, what is the second main takeaway? You just gotta be yourself. Just be who you are. Stop with this freaking hoity toity stuff and just say, this is who I am. Take it or leave it. I don't care. I mean, it's just, it's, it's stop trying to. Stop trying to impress people. Just be who you are. People, I know authenticity, everyone talks about that, but there's, there's absolute validity to that. Just be authentic. Be who you are. It's okay. If you drop And your third main takeaway. After two years of going self-employed, if it doesn't work, you can always go back. It's no big deal. No one's gonna say, oh, you try to, you know, try to go on your own. You're a bad person. Everyone's gonna be envious of you. But no one's not gonna hire you in two years if it doesn't work out. That's the way I always put it. You know, to get the show notes, you just head back to mitchellchadro.com slash show 077. And also to keep in touch with Josh, again, everyone should connect with Josh on his YouTube channel. So I will have a link right there in the show notes. You'll subscribe. You'll click the notification bell and yes. get started on your financial freedom for life. 
I know, Josh, that you love comments, questions. I even see that, that you've actually featured some of those questions in some of your YouTube videos. So again, subscribe now and get started for your life of abundance and financial freedom. Any final words here, Josh? No, I appreciate it, man. I just, no, I think I've, uh, you know, spoken all I want to say, but just keep doing what you're doing. I, I, I think you're going to reach, or you, I don't know who you're reaching, but I imagine there's a guy right now or a lady in her car sitting there saying, ah, i got to start. I, I, I just tell you, lady, do it. Uh, just do it. You know, obviously think about it, but uh, you, you'll be better off. And in two years, if it doesn't work, you can go back, maybe not to the same job, but to a similar job. And you'll say, hey, I tried. It didn't work. And that's okay. But just try. It's, you just got one life. So I love what you're doing, Mitchell, and I'm glad you reached out to me. Absolutely. Well, Josh, this has been fantastic. We really appreciate all the advice and all the guidance that you're giving everybody. Your straight-up way about you is just wonderful. Thank you again for coming on the Listen Up Show. Until next time, my trusted friends. Send me your questions after you sign up at the website at mitchellchadro.com slash sign up. We're also on Spotify and iHeartRadio, and you can, of course, find us in the iTunes store. And the best podcast player that I'm aware of is Overcast.fm. You could actually go over there and subscribe at mitchellchadro.com slash Overcast. Thank you so much for subscribing to my email list and providing a written review on iTunes. MitchellChadro.com slash iTunes. It helps other people find the show. Be good now. Until next time, my trusted friends.